This morning we'll be in 1 Peter 4, um, if you would like to flip there as I introduce myself. My name is Colton Fulton, and I have the great pleasure of serving at Olivet Baptist Church uh, down in Wichita. And <clears throat> I say this, I truly mean it, it is a joy to be here with you. Um, it's, it was fun interacting with some of you. Uh, I was told that I will have a pop quiz at the end of this, and I'll have to know every one of your names. So. I pray that you would be graceful and you would show me mercy. <laughs> now, um, like I said, this morning we will be spending our time in 1 Peter 4, and we'll be looking at verses 7 through 11. <clears throat> I meant to look in the Pew Bibles for you, but I think you'll all have your own. So we'll read 1 Peter 4, 7 through 11. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-control and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling, and as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. And whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, and whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord remains forever. Pray with me. Uh, Heavenly Father, God, we thank you. Uh, just thank you for a time to gather with one another. Lord, we thank you that you have given us your word, and we know that it is truth. Um, Lord, in that in your word, you've revealed yourself, your, your character, your plan for redemption. Uh, not only your plan for redemption, uh, but for how we are to live in light of this redemption um, that we have from your son. Lord, I ask that you would just enlighten the eyes of our hearts uh, to see and behold that you are good. Um, that we would see this through your word and to know that you are indeed coming back. God, I pray especially um, in this time, Lord, that you would increase and I would decrease um, all for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So typically in our church, I would just jump right into the passage, but since y'all are in 1 Corinthians and not 1 Peter, I think it would be helpful to kind of summarize where we are in this passage. So Peter is writing a letter to those who he has called elect exiles. So they are in a, a foreign land. And he starts the letter by reminding them that they were born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable and, and in heaven. And then in chapter 2, he tells the exiles how they are a new people being built up into a spiritual house and that they were going to have to live honorable lives of, before all of those um, who are before them, who are uh, persecuting them, that being harsh masters, and to some unbelieving spouses, and others some governing officials. Um, they are to follow Christ's example and how he walked through suffering. And in their suffering, they are to point those who are persecuting them to Christ. In this passage before ours, Peter calls them not to live as the world lives, um, but to seek to live for the will of God. So our, this morning we will see how Peter has divided our section, uh, chapter seven or chapter four, verse seven through eleven, into three parts. And out of those three parts, I'll pull my three main points. So the main points will be this: first, it will be the context, and we'll see that in verse seven. And then second point will be the commands, and we'll see that in verses seven through eleven. And then finally, it will be an all-consuming praise, verse eleven. So first, context. Second, the commands, and third, consuming praise. So let's look at verse or point one, the context. Uh, let's put our eyes on verse seven. He says, the end of all things is at hand. Your copy of God's word might read, the end of all things is near. Um, they both kind of get the same message out. Uh, this theme of the end is nothing new. Uh, Peter has sprinkled it throughout his text or throughout his letter. And Peter uses this rem and reminds the people to comfort them um, as it usually points to Christ's return and the inheritance that they will acquire on that day, our ultimate deliverance, our ultimate salvation. Therefore, Peter uses this beginning to set up the rest of our passage. So it should be an encouragement that Christ is on his way. 
So because the end is near, though this was written in the 60s AD, um, we know that Peter would understand that the end of all things began once Christ died and he resurrected and he ascended. So for us to live with the end in mind, we must <clears throat> remember what started the end, that being Christ. So it's important for us to reflect on what 1 Peter 3.8 says. It says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. As we sang, what amazing love, how can it be? He, being righteous, died for us, being unrighteous. And then again in chapter 1, verse 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So if we live our lives apart from the gospel, then the commands that I will go through today that Peter gives us for the end times will be nothing less than living a morally good life, checking boxes, and not experiencing the joy of the Lord. So if it is the gospel that has begun the end of all things, it is the gospel that fuels our good works, and then it is the gospel that will fuel our praise. So a, our Anglican bishop from the 1800s, um, I like to pull quotes from old, old dead men, and his name is J.C. Ryle. He puts it well in his book to young men. Hear me, well, I believe all the principles in the book apply to all of us, though it was addressed to young men. Um, he says this in regard to the brevity of life. Tomorrow is the devil's day, but today is God's. Satan cares not how spiritual your intentions may be and how holy your resolutions, if only they are fixed for tomorrow. Oh, give not place to the devil in this matter. Answer him, no, Satan, it shall be today, today. All men do not live to be patriarchs like Isaac and Jacob. Many children die before their fathers. David had to mourn the death of his two finest sons. Job lost all ten children in one day. Your life may be like one of theirs. And this is true for everyone. When death summons, it will be vain to talk of tomorrow. You must go at once. You see what Ryle is telling us here? He is giving us a serious reminder that the end of life may be near. Therefore, we should live godly lives today. Uh, more importantly, Peter is saying the same thing. He says, Jesus' life, death, and resurrection and ascension has ushered in the end times the time between Jesus' first coming and his second coming. And the gospel is what initiates the end, but um, it is also how we are to live oops, for the glory of the Lord, as well as the good of those around us. And this will be our second point, which will take up most of our time. So point two, the commands. Let's put our eyes back on chapter or four, verse seven. We'll start. He says, therefore, be self-controlled, sober-minded for the sake of your prayers, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling, and as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. So before we jump into these imperatives, I want us to see how this comes on the heels of how the world lives. Um, we know this, right? This comes right before our passage in verse 3. You can look up just a little bit. He says, for the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. So Peter, in our text, is contrasting godly living marked by self-control, love, and sacrifice with the selfish and sinful world of this passage. So and right before that, we are told that we are to live the rest of the time in our flesh, meaning bodily, for the will of God and not our passions. And that is why Peter comes to our text and gives us five imperatives to help us live lives that glorify God and is, are for the good of one another, particularly for those within the local church. So put our eyes, verse 7 again, I'll read it. 
He says, therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Peter lays out the first two imperatives, be self-controlled and be sober-minded. So what does it mean to be self-controlled? I think I found a definition that helps me capture it well. It says, to be self-controlled is the ability to control oneself, particularly one's emotions and desires, or the expressions of them. And this is my favorite part about it, especially in difficult situations. So let us remind ourselves that Peter was not writing to believers that are having a good go at it. Um, no, they're exiles. Um, but those who are being ridiculed and mocked, and they're those who are being ridiculed, mocked, and maligned. Um, they were under harsh masters. They were um, in marriages with unbelievers. Uh, they were seeking to keep their conduct honorable in hopes that those who ridicule them, these uh, harsh masters and those unbelievers in their marriages, uh, those who malign them, may see their good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So for this, they must be self-controlled. We are not to be controlled by or dependent on our passions. Um, as our text before says, the world is driven that way. And we are to be under controlled to live godly lives marked by prayer and dependence upon God. Our next imperative is a call to be sober-minded. Uh, to be sober-minded is to have a mind that is clear, to be alert. Peter is calling them, the exiles, to have mental alertness that seems, sees life correctly in light of the coming in. Sober would contrast with being drunk. Where we are to be aware and alert, drunkenness would prevent, or to be intoxicated would prevent us from seeing life as it is, as we're thinking clearly. Um, today, our society, um, as it says in the verses four, has a list of them. They desire to indulge in a lot of things, but particularly in relaxation and, and comfort, which is not a bad thing in and of itself. Um, I think it is important, though, to note that we are to be alert. Uh, as one pastor puts it, he says, don't live like those in the world who are constantly looking for an escape. They look forward to the evening and the weekend when they can just, quote, turn off their minds. They desire an escape from reality. Yet for the working Christian, and this is not speaking of a vocation, uh, but all those who are in Christ, we can think of Ephesians 2.10, so for the working Christian, there is nothing further from the truth. We are to be different. We are to be clear-thinking men and women, and we are to have our mental faculties with us all the time. Peter commands, Peter's commands are for the sake of our prayers, and when we think clearly, we will pray. My question for us today, um, and this is something that I've been asking myself, when it comes to being self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of our prayers, is this, what causes you not to pray? Could it be social media? Uh, some of us, our phones, others watching the news. Maybe it's watching the Chiefs or your favorite sports team, um, YouTube videos, newspaper, you name it. You know yourselves. Um, and these things aren't bad in them, themselves. Apart from my phone this morning, I would still be driving around the state of Kansas trying to find this place. So, but whatever category or thing that we do not practice self-control, we will make our minds distracted and fuzzy and we will be consumed. Therefore, we will not pray. I think John Piper hits the nail on the head when he said in a tweet back in 2009, he says one of the greatest uses of Twitter and Facebook, and I would say fill in the blank of what takes up most of your time or your mental faculties, um, will prove to be at the last day that prayerlessness was not a lack, not from a lack of time. In light of the end of all things, let us be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of our prayers. Our next imperative comes from verse 8. Let's put our eyes there. He says, above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. When we take a look at this verse in the first half, two things should jump out to us. We, are to see, we see that our love is to be earnest, uh, which means that our love is to be constant and genuine, and that our love is to be directed not to ourselves, but what? 
to one another. Yeah, that was counterculture then, and um, I think we could all agree it's counterculture now. We live in a world that tells us to fend for yourself, to, to love yourself, to put others down if it means building yourself up. But in light of living in the end, in light of living in the gospel, we are to love one another constantly and genuinely. Uh, this loving one another is not a new idea that Peter is coming up with on his own. No. we got to remember who Peter was. He was a disciple who was very near to Christ. So he is pulling from Christ's teaching. And we know from John 13 that Jesus says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I've, I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So though Peter was not the self-identified disciple whom Jesus loved, he made sure to include it in his writing because Jesus made it clear on its importance. In Ephesians 2, it says that because of the great love with which he loved us, being God, that even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. So this means that we are to live a life of love for one another, especially for our brothers and sisters in Christ, those who, as Peter says in chapter 2, verse 9, are part of the chosen people. So... I'll give you a little information about my life. My wife and I have two of the sweetest boys, okay? They are adorable, they are kind, and I am very biased. Um, they, like their father, are still sinners, though they seem they could do no wrong. Uh, Jude, he's the oldest, he's three, and then we have Titus, who is one, and if I'm wanting Jude to understand something, what do I do? I, I get on his level, I, I come to him, and I tell him, and then I repeat, and I make sure he understands it. Because if I want him to comprehend it, and especially if it's for his good, I want to make sure it, the wheels are turning up there. So in the same way, Peter has already addressed this, this subject of loving one another. Listen, in chapter 1, verse 22, he says, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, which is having faith in the gospel, for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. See that word earnest come up again? And then he says in chapter 2, verse 17, he says, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God and honor the emperor. So I believe this is what parents do and what good teachers do if they want to make sure their audience are listening and that they don't miss it. My prayer is that we will not miss the importance of this love for one another, as Peter has brought up. So we're at the end of verse 8, and I think this is, it gets a little tricky. Uh, he says, love covers a multitude of sins. We know that it is only the blood of Christ alone that atones and covers sins. So why does Peter say that? I personally will defer to a pastor named David Helm, and he says this about verse 8. I think it's super helpful. He says, what Peter is saying here might be understood by way of analogy. Love takes oxygen out of sin, the way a blanket chokes the air from one caught on fire. Similarly, as long as oxygen is present, forest fires rages. But if we could take air away, the blaze would settle down and great tracts of land would be saved. May we love in this same way. May nothing evil be allowed to breathe for long, and may we keep short accounts. The last days demand our sincerest love. Brothers and sisters, for the sake of our witness, would we love in a way that would stop the spread of sin? And Peter moves on to verse 9 with another imperative that is amidst the end of all things. Take a look at verse 9. He says, Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. The fifth imperative that Peter has given us is to show hospitality to one another. So what is hospitality? To our world, it is to entertain or to host people. Uh, generally, it's a way to get something out of someone. Um, and it usually happens for monetary gain. I'll invite you to this event if you donate to my event or to my cause. Or um, I'll invite you over to my house so I get invited to your house and you serve me steaks. Um, but for the Christian, 
hospitality has different means and motives and ends. Um, why? Because it's not about us. Biblical hospitality is about fully honoring God. And we do this by obeying his command from Romans 12, 13, by contributing to the needs of the saints and to seek to show hospitality. So we are to focus on the well-being and the care of others in our hospitality, not for what we can get out of this. And I think it's important to note when you are surveying scripture and you're looking at what it means to be a pastor or an elder and you see all the qualifications in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, what is one thing that both comes up? Hospitality. So, and we know that these lists, we should know that these lists and these texts are not for the superstar Christians, the ones that are up here or serving in some capacity. Um, no, these lists of qualifications are but the baseline of Christianity for the character, of the Christian character. So, um, also to want to mention, in the first century, hospitality was very important and needed, uh, especially for those who are traveling around sharing the gospel. Uh, typically, lodging was either non-existent, not affordable, or not available. It's not as readily available as it is today. Uh, so a traveler, get this, would head to the town center, like just imagine going down to Wichita, and you're going downtown, in hopes of being invited home by a kind and gracious resident. So this type of hospitality would have cost that family shares of food and definitely comfort. Their houses were not as big as ours are today, where the guests might have their own bedroom. They were probably in very close quarters. So this is why I think Peter adds a qualifier. Did y'all catch it? Look back at verse 9. He says, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Peter, anticipating the selfishness of our hearts, adds a qualifier that we may be reminded that it is more blessed to give than to receive. Uh, like I said earlier, I have, we have two toddlers now. Um, and to that example, if I want my boys to understand something, I have to repeat, right? And repeat again and repeat again. Um, so in our home, we have a saying that I say to our boys, or my wife and I say to our boys, and it is, we value people over possessions. And if you've ever had kids, you know why I'm saying that. It's because they don't want to share their toys. Um, but... Uh, my hope is that he and or both our boys and myself as I'm preaching to myself is that I would understand that we as the Fultons will choose to serve and to love and to sacrifice even if it costs us. We will value that person made in the image of God more than all of our belongings because God cares about them. Generally speaking, um, I have to, like I said, repeat that not only to Jude, but to myself um, as things get broken and um, we're depleting funds to feed families. So. But if you have been part of a church, uh, a hospitable church, um, y'all seem very hospitable, um, you know that on the other side of hospitality, uh, like I said, if I've met you earlier and we've had a conversation, you probably heard I said the word y'all, so you know I'm not from these parts. Uh, I am from Texas, so as a Christian who's away from family, uh, the hospitality of brothers and sisters within my local church has been one of the most encouraging things to my soul and to my family. Um, we have shared and celebrated holidays, uh, birthdays, and just exciting news. I, I think it's important, though, to remember that the context that Peter is writing to, these exiles, they, they weren't having a good time, right? They were in the midst of suffering. My family, we have shared tears and hugs and driveways with our brothers and sisters. Uh, we have had long walks and longer conversations on members' couches in times of sufferings. Uh, brothers and sisters, love one another earnestly and show hospitality. Uh, this leads us to our fifth and final point, or our final imperative. Sorry, three points, five imperatives. I got you all on that one. Uh, let's put our eyes on verse 10. He says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, and whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. Our final imperative is to serve one another. So we have love one another, show hospitality to one another, and now serve one another. I hope you see the one anotherness and the care for the body.
So we are to serve one another with the giftings that God has given us. Um, and Peter didn't choose to go into great detail of these spiritual gifts. Uh, he just breaks them down into two categories. He has speaking, and then he has serving. And I want you to note that Peter hadn't put one gift over the other. He didn't say, those with the spiritual gift of speaking are far superior than those who serve. No. He emphasizes one thing. I hope we see this. He emphasizes that he, being God, is the one who gives the gifts to the Christian. And if you are a follower of Christ, you've been given a gift, not for yourself, but to serve one another. So, and my favorite thing about the spiritual gifts, if you notice, is this, that even in the gift that is given to you, you still don't have the power to do it. Look, he says, the gift of speaking as one who speaks oracles of God. If you have been gifted with the gift of teaching and speaking or preaching, look at our text. It is not hitting that you are eloquent or you're smarter than other people, but it is what the content is, the words that are being said. They are the very words of God, and that's what makes teaching effective, the living word of God. And then he goes to the serving, the gift of serving by the strength that God supplies. If you are gifted in serving, realize it is not your own strength but it is purely the grace that we have the power to serve one another. This is like God gave you a gift on Christmas and then said, oh, wait, you need batteries. Don't worry, I am the battery. You need not only the gift I gave you, but you need myself to actually walk and do those. So we are utterly dependent upon him. It is purely grace. God does this. So when we live with the end in mind, we will live lives that seek to build up one another and glorify God, which leads us to praise him. And our third and final point is this found in verse 11. I'll read it. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Peter is bringing up in bringing up the glory of the Lord, he breaks out into praise. Um, when we see truly through Jesus Christ, we have been born again to a living hope, our lives start to live for him and his glory. We saw that in the beginning of 1 Peter, and we see that throughout our text. And we join Peter in praising God, that he alone gets the glory. As in, we are to love one another, be hospitable, and to serve. It's not about us. It's about serving one another and about him getting the glory. And our text tells us that in everything, I mean everything, God may be glorified. In every aspect of your life, from greeting each other to walking downstairs to in every aspect, seek to glorify God. I mean, think about our text. In us being sober-minded, we know that it is from him that our minds are being renewed. Praise him. In us loving one another, we know that it is because he first loved us. Praise God. In our hospitality to one another, it is because we have been brought into the family of God and at such a great cost. Praise be to God. In our gifts, as I mentioned, they are from him and they are powered by him. Praise him. In everything, we are new creations and we seek to praise God. And living this way in the end times and suffering particularly, um, it can be hard, right? Uh, but Christian, take heart and don't be discouraged uh, because our example is Christ. And we know that from chapter 2, 21. And listen, he was self-controlled and sober-minded and communed with God through prayer. And because of his great love, he laid down his life for whom he has called. And he showed his care for those around him and fed them. And he used his life ultimately to bring glory to the Father. And we should praise him. To him, God, be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Join me in praying. Lord, we are so thankful uh, for your word. God, we uh, love you, and you are deserving of all praise. Father, would you um, help us by your spirit working in through us to live lives that have Jesus' second coming in mind? Uh, would you help us to be sober-minded, to be self-controlled, would you allow for this church, Emmanuel Baptist, to be a church that uh, loves one another well, that shows hospitality, 
um, that use the gifts that you have given them um, for your glory. Lord, I pray that these uh, brothers and sisters would go out and seek to uh, serve and love and show hospitality and to ultimately glorify you. In Jesus' name.